Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever this finds you. My name is Danny Harris. I am incredibly honored to be the Executive Director of Transportation Alternatives based in New York and, and very happy to welcome you to what's next for our streets. Uh, we joined with many of you, including some of you on the panel, uh, for our Vision Zero conference just a few months ago before the election. And there we obviously had a series of conversations about what might come next, not just for our streets, but our cities, our state, and our nation as it related to transportation policy. Now, as we prepare for a new administration to come into Washington, we're incredibly honored to share the, the panel today with some incredible um, thought leaders and transportation experts uh, across the country. Uh, I'm so honored to welcome Ulysses Cleckley, who is the executive director and led the creation of the new Department of Transportation and Infrastructure for the city and county of Denver. Uh, welcome, Ulysses. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Our, our great pleasure. Uh, David Fields uh, is the city of Houston's first chief transportation planner and provides strategic leadership for the city's system level transportation planning efforts. David, a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everybody. Jeff Sriver serves as the Director of Transportation Planning and Programming for the Chicago Department of Transportation. Welcome, Jeff. Hello, glad to be here, thank you. Uh, Jessica Zank is the Deputy Director of Transportation Planning and Project Delivery for the City of San Jose's Department of Transportation. A warm welcome, Jessica. Good morning and good afternoon. So as I started, you know, across the country, we're all preparing for, for what the Biden-Harris administration uh, means for our work or may mean from our work. Um, so here in New York City, we actually just had our uh, commissioner just resigned. Uh, she is actually moving to go be part of the, uh, the Transportation Transition Committee. Uh, that's Commissioner Polly Trottenberg. Uh, so we wanted to spend a bit of time sort of discussing what we know so far. Uh, none of us are fortune tellers. I'm sure we all have strong opinions about what this may mean, but really just to talk a bit about what this could mean for the next four years or more as it relates to our work. So I, what I'd like to just start with is I, I'd welcome if each of you could just give us a bit of grounding in your work. Uh, and if I could just ask, and Jessica, I'd love to start with you. Could you just share your vision in San Jose about how people move around and what steps you're taking to get there? Absolutely. And again, it's, it's great to be here. Happy to, to see everybody, um, even those who are participating who I can't visually see. Um, many of you uh, may not have been to San Jose. Uh, I know, you know, we were fortunate enough to have uh, Danny and his family here for a few years. So I know some of you know a bit about us, but San Jose is actually the largest uh, city in the Bay Area. We have roughly a million people and about 180 square miles. Most of the city was built out in the post-war period uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and our urban form really reflects that. So I think, you know, we have a lot of uh, roadway miles, about 2,400 throughout the city. Uh, most of our uh, population lives in a pretty uh, suburban uh, framework and don't have many opportunities other than to drive. So our challenge has really been about um, retrofitting suburbia in most of the city and taking the most advantage of the portions of San Jose that have kind of older, uh, more urban bones, densifying within those areas to give people more opportunities for housing, more opportunities to work close to where they live to have um, you know, their families uh, and their neighborhoods be more of a 15 minute, 20 minute neighborhoods. Uh, and that is kind of the city's general plan is moving in that direction. We also have an aggressive climate plan, Climate Smart San Jose, a new bike plan, Better Bike Plan San Jose, which has more than 400 miles of all ages and abilities, uh, class four, uh, separated bikeways and uh, bike boulevards um, in the plan. And we're moving aggressively towards that vision of a city where you can get what you need without having to use your car. Uh, that's not the case for most people in San Jose today, but it's uh, the vision that we're moving forward toward. We have some very exciting work also underway with our partners uh, like the California High-Speed Rail Authority and the Bay Area's regional rail and transit agencies, both BART 
and uh, the Caltrain system. So we talk more about that, but this is all part of our transition um, from a city that grew by growing out into a city that also has a more urban core and can also grow up. So I'll leave it there for now, uh, allow other folks time to talk, um, but happy to, to be here and answer more questions. So maybe as we, as we keep moving, Ulysses, can, can we turn to you and then David and Jeff? Yeah, sure. And, and thanks for the question, Danny. So, so here in Denver, uh, Denver uh, for the past two years has grown um, uh, to be one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Um, we have amassed uh, an additional 120,000 new residents in Denver proper in the past seven years. And uh, it, it's interesting being in my role for the past two and a half years or so that uh, uh, the sentiment behind all the population growth has spurred more pressure on our infrastructure from a, bit, a mobility standpoint. And I have to remind people that yes, Denver is a city. It's no, it's no longer kind of a sleepy town you know, just uh, outside of the, of, of the Rocky Mountains. And so with that comes a, a lot of pressures to figure out ways to move people um, regardless of the mode that they choose. It's, it's been traditionally a city built for, for vehicles. Um, about 73% uh, of the people travel in a single occupancy vehicle. And uh, there's been a clear edict uh, by the mayor to reduce the reliance on single occupancy vehicles and increase transit, uh, walking and biking in the city and county of Denver. And so we have some very aggressive visionary goals to reduce that 73% down of SOVs down to 50%. And that basically doubled the amount of people um, traveling by, by bus or rail or walking or biking uh, uh, by the year 2030. So right now we're averaging around uh, six or 7% for people uh, taking transit. And of course that's been depressed due to COVID. And uh, we have a goal of 15% to take transit. And then uh, we have about 4% uh, of the folks are, who are walking and biking. Uh, going to places of, of work um, or amenities, and we're trying to increase that uh, up to 15% for uh, people biking and or walking to get to where they need to go. So very aggressive goals, uh, and we have 10 years left to try to meet it, so we'll see how that goes. But um, in terms of how that uh, has impacted our focus uh, from a department perspective, and this is quite frankly one of the reasons why we needed to transition away from uh, being the Department of Public Works, which is what we were called prior to when I arrived to now the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, is that we needed to understand the full spectrum of what's going to be required to help meet those visionary goals that's been set out. So everything to how we think about our streets, to how we deliver those projects. And so we are very focused on, on making sure that we redesign our streets to accommodate pedestrians and bicycles, and that uh, we help support um, uh, our regional uh, Transit Authority, uh, RTD, so the Regional uh, Transportation District, uh, figure out ways to help support them and, and push on them and be a little bit more aggressive to how we're pull, uh, 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 delivering high capacity and medium capacity transit uh, projects moving forward. And then eventually for us as a department to actually uh, hopefully uh, own, maintain and operate our own uh, transit service so we can provide those localized trips that otherwise wouldn't be contemplated from, from uh, RTD's regional perspective. And so those are just like some examples of what we're doing and we're trying to do it in a much more aggressive manner and at a quicker pace um, because our infrastructure needs to keep up with the uh, population increases and the demands that is, is placed on our infrastructure. So, so I'll stop there, that's kind of where we are and, and uh, we've been making a lot of good headway in the past couple of years. It's been, it's been a complete change in culture and mindset for the department, for the city. And that comes with its own set of challenges, but uh, uh, we're really set up to really accelerate how we're delivering our work to, to meet those uh, visionary goals from a modal perspective. Danny, I think you said you wanted me to go next. Uh, so good afternoon from Houston, Texas. It's interesting to hear uh, those two speakers because a lot of what you said really are uh, reflective here as well. Um, we are an extremely uh, big city geographically. Uh, we're 670 square miles uh, with a road along all of that. Um, we're 2.3 million people. 
Um, and we are really, we are very spread out. This was a city that predominantly got developed in the 80s when everything boomed and went uh, across. Um, but uh, what it has meant is that uh, there's a perception that everybody drives, um, but that perception isn't actually reality. We have way more people uh, walking and biking and taking transit than anybody would recognize, um, but they don't get recognized and they don't get uh, incorporated into our planning process yet. Um, and it really shows in a very simple stat. Right now, every single year, more than 200 people die on our roads and more than 1,000 people are seriously injured. And we can talk about mode splits and travel times and uh, metrics galore, but if we can't stop people from dying, then we are not doing our job as a city. Um, so we come to work in our, our little transportation planning division every single day with the goal to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries on our roads. That's a mission we can wrap our arms around. That's a mission that any community we go to, they understand. And it's a very different conversation when we talk about safety improvements, road diets, uh, just letting people cross the street safely is our starting point. Um, we are very, very lucky uh, to have a mayor and a city council who's been very supportive of this. Uh, we are on the verge uh, next week of releasing our Vision Zero Action Plan. We have uh, a bike plan with 1,500 miles of high comfort bike facilities. And when I say this, a lot of people say, no, no, no you mean 150. No, we're talking 1,500 miles and we already have 400 miles of it done. Uh, we have a uh, transit uh, provider, Metro, that are our partners. Uh, and it's interesting to hear about Denver. We are never planning to be our own transit provider. We rely on Metro. Uh, they have a great uh, moving forward plan. We support them in that. And the better they do, the better we do. Um, so all of these pieces together are going to shift us to be a safe, accessible city for everybody who lives here. Um, thank you and uh, greetings from Chicago. Uh, my name is Jeff Shriver. I'm the Director of Transportation Planning and Programming for the City of Chicago's Department of Transportation. And uh, um, Chicago, as uh, like most people know, was uh, mostly, uh, the city at least, was mostly developed out in the streetcar uh, era. So um, our city is, uh, has, has a lot of uh, very uh, good bones, we think, from a uh, um, you know, a, a transportation perspective with a, uh, a, a very robust grid, a very robust sidewalk network, um, and a, a, a grid transit system, uh, radial uh, rapid transit rail lines, and, uh, and a strong commuter rail system connecting out to the suburbs. Um, a lot of the suburbs were also built around the train lines, but then obviously a lot of the, the post-war growth in the suburbs has been very auto-dominated. Um, so the Chicago region uh, in the last few decades has been a very uh, stable uh, from a population perspective. Um, it's uh, not a high growth uh, uh, city like uh, the other panelists uh, on the uh, on the on, on today's uh, webinar. Um, however, I think that that sort of that top line statistic kind of masks um, um, what's what's going on uh, on the ground is that there are actually parts of the city and, and parts of the, the region too that are, are quite high growth. Um, there are the downtown central business district um, has has been booming in recent decades and it's uh, the central area has become a very large residential community uh, with uh, uh, several hundred thousand people living in within a couple miles of the traditional loop, which is an area that just a, a couple generations ago had virtually nobody living there, a lot of people working there. And now it's a live workspace. Um, but so at the same time that there's a, a lot of growth happening in some parts of the city, there's a lot of uh, decline happening in other parts of the city. And um, so I think one of the, the, the key issues that we uh, have here in Chicago, and I think all, a lot of cities, uh, but this particularly acute here, is, is the equity perspective on our transportation investments. And how do the investments and the priorities that we have on transportation um, uh, help us to achieve a, a more balanced uh, growth and a more inclusive uh, um, economic prosperity for everybody? Um, so, so that's obviously that's a very high level objective. Uh, 
in some ways kind of intangible, but but that has to be sort of a bedrock uh, guiding perspective from the decisions that we make. Um, but in addition to that, another bedrock we have is uh, similar to, to what David just mentioned, and I think in many other cities is the you know, Vision Zero, Zero perspective, that although we have this robust and, and, and well-built out uh, infrastructure that of course we need to keep maintaining, um, there, are, there are ways in which that infrastructure over the years have, has been designed um, that, that, that may not provide the, uh, the, the best uh, or the, the sort of state of the art in terms of uh, tra tra traffic safety and safety for all modes. So pedestrian safety, bicycle safety. Um, so not just looking at the old perspective of safety only for from the perspective of the driver in, in behind the steering wheel. So, so we've been doing a lot in, in recent decades and in recent years in the city to, to build out a, a safe uh, on-street and off-street bike network, uh, taking advantage of, of the grid of streets that we have, um, helping to better connect uh, the pedestrian realm and, and make sure that, uh, uh, that we have a good safe access to uh, all of the transit facilities in the city and all of the parks and recreation as well. Um, so I think there's there's a lot more to say. I think one another one just to, to just start off with another big aspect that affects Chicago transportation is uh, freight. I know freight and deliveries have been growing in in all major cities, but Chicago is really a, kind of a freight hub for the nation. So we think kind of get a disproportionate share of a lot of the freight impacts, both on the rail side and on the truck side. So that's yet another factor that has to be sort of balanced in with, with all of our other decisions. Great, thank you all. Um, you know, I, I, I know obviously being in New York, we're really focused here on our, our little corner of the world, but I actually have to say that all of you have such huge road plates and are, you know, navigating, especially with San Jose, these 12 mile, these 12 foot lanes that you can easily, or not, maybe not so easily, but reduce to try to bring some of these changes. It's, it's not only ambitious, but I think in New York, as advanced as we are, we wish we certainly had <laughs> more space that we could play with to try to get to some of these changes. I, I guess I just wanted to start with a bit of history and, and I'm curious if maybe you could just put your hand up if you were working on transportation at the local level um, during the last uh, transition between Obama to Trump. Um, Does so, consulting count? Uh, you, can, you can define it as you like if you were sort of in this space. I, I think what I'd like to just start with is get your perspective on, you know, how significant is this sort of change in Washington and what does it mean at the local level? And I'm just curious if those who, of you who are part of it might share sort of a word or two about what actually did something change in the city? What was sort of significant about new leadership in Washington as it, as it meant for your ability to deliver projects on the ground in your cities? Jeff, can I start with you? Sure. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good, good question. Because, you know, in some ways, I mean, f federal, this is both good and bad, but f federal sort of policy making and decisions is, is like the proverbial, you know, moving the giant ship, right? It doesn't, doesn't turn on a dime, doesn't move that fast. So in, so in some ways, um, you know, sort of business as usual carries on, <laughs> even if the political climate changes uh, relatively sharply. Um, so... So, so in, in you know, in many ways, you know, at the at the ground level, we work with all the same FHWA reps that, that we've worked with for many years, and we work with the same Federal Transit Administration reps we have, and we have those relationships, and you know, that's sort of proceeded um, apace, and we still get our decisions made. Um, I think that you know, some just the. The, the flavor and the tenor of decision making has, has, has obviously changed in the last four years and it's uh, become a lot, from our perspective, it seems to be a lot more rural focused than urban focused. So like say some of the discretionary grant programs that are out there, um, we found that our projects uh, seem to be a lot less competitive than, than they had been before. Um, on the other hand, like we have a, a major freight rail initiative that we're working on here in Chicago called the CREATE program. And we achieved our largest federal grant ever under the current administration. Um, maybe freight rail is in that sort of that sweet spot that it kind of, it helps everybody in the whole country and it's not, not seen as, a, and maybe as partisan as some other types of investments. I don't know, or maybe we just got lucky. I know. <laughs> I'd like to think we wrote a very compelling application, but so I, you know, I think it's 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 there's been some trade-offs, but maybe not quite as as strong as as as, as you might think. <laughs> 
Yeah, if, if I may, I, I just build on that um, because I think that our experience has been pretty similar to, to what Jeff just described in terms of um, many things, you know, perhaps kept moving, although not quickly, right? And that goes in particular for some of the big, uh, big federal transit uh, grants and projects that we've been working on with our partners, like uh, bringing the BART extension, for example, into San Jose that has continued to move forward under this administration. Um, and as we look forward into the new year, I think it could mean, and perhaps it should mean, a whole lot more for, for cities um, to have this opportunity with the new administration, especially with the um, focus on climate um, that I think the, the new administration has certainly been discussing, as well as putting climate and equity at the foreground um, for our cities. Those are huge and critically important. Um, and so the opportunity to move forward with the new administration, I think, uh, offers perhaps a bigger change than we've experienced um, in the past. Um, so I think I'm, I'm hopeful about what it could mean for um, streets, for kind of seeing um, climate vision zero and equitable access go into uh, effect on our streets. And then also for some of those, um, you know, once in a century projects uh, that have been, you know, on the back burner, that those could move forward much more quickly. That's my hope. Yeah, and, and I would say I would have to uh, agree um, with Jeff and Jess uh, as well, because uh, you know, federal government is an albatross that you're not going to change in four years, right? So the process is a process, and feds are there to provide oversight. <laughs> I do think that there are certain aspects, though, of their tone and tenor that weren't um, aligning with what cities need. And I think that's the biggest benefit of hopefully of a new administration. So one, to have a, a more um, concrete understanding of the infrastructure needs from a city standpoint and having the programs to invest into that infrastructure for cities uh, more effectively. And this, these are things that in my conversations with uh, the new um, uh, uh, organizations that are, are dealing with the new administration, that's that's the push, is that we need more direct aid to cities so we can handle our own projects, not get, a, get caught up in the morass of, of the federal, even state um, uh, funding um, processes. So, so there's some excitement around that, but even I think both of you mentioned the timing of decision-making um, and that has direct impact to cities. And I'll give you an example where we uh, were trying to install our second set of transit only lanes here in Denver. And uh, we submitted in a request to, to utilize a new kind of design method. We're, we're just talking about red paint here. And we sent it in to the local federal highway office and then at the ultimate request because of an exemption from the MUTCD, the design manual, we had to go to headquarters. Uh, as we basically didn't, didn't get a response. And when I say not a response, as in nobody would talk to us. <laughs> so, so we had to take it upon ourselves to take a risk to go out and, and actually uh, um, you know, move forward with that project without getting the full support from the headquarters office there at Federal Highway. And hopefully nobody from Federal Highway is on the phone. But regardless, that, that is a, that's a real thing that we had to deal with. But alas, we were able to get through it. And, and now we have... Uh, we are able to um, have now two new dedicated uh, bus lanes, two dedicated transit lanes that connect our Civic Center Station, which is a major transit hub, all the way to our Union Station, which is a, a transit hub that connects uh, uh, the majority of our, our bus lines here in downtown Denver to, to the rail, um, so people can get in and out of the city. So it's things like that where I think it's been um, some friction with cities and administration, and hopefully we don't uh, have as, as a part of the new administration. As I wasn't working in uh, city government directly at that point, uh, I think what's been said is going to cover it okay for us. Okay. So um, given that um, very sort of real <laughs> perspective on the, the, the changes and what we can expect, I, I also just want to maybe talk about some of the, at least some of the language that we're seeing coming out of the Biden Harris administration early on. 
Um, so we've heard sort of pledges, quote, to invest in infrastructure for pedestrians, cyclists, and riders of e-scooters and other micro-mobility micro vehicles. Uh, we've seen a pledge for to bring zero emission public transit options to every city with over a thousand residents. We've obviously heard for a desire to sort of increase funding and things like trains and public transit. So I guess given what you said, um, and also sort of given some of the early pledges that we're hearing, could you maybe just sort of talk about, you know, maybe um, even if, if, even if the, are you seeing a, a shift in language and does that potentially change what's happening on the ground in terms of some of the work that you're talking about? Maybe, is there a way that even you can leverage some of the pledges in better support of the work that you're doing on the ground, even how slowly the government moves? Well, I think uh, maybe just to start it off, uh, I don't think the government has to move as slowly as it does, right? And I think we've seen that um, in the work that, that we've all done as, as cities to really think differently about how quickly we can change our roadways, right? Um, reference road diets or quick build projects, right? We've all kind of gotten a flavor for the fact that um, you know, perhaps it doesn't have to take five years to redo a street, right? Perhaps we can move differently. And I think that if there were kind of, um, you know, one of the things that the federal government, if it really wants to make change quickly for our cities and on climate policy and on equity, it can prioritize funding differently. And I mean that almost as much procedurally as, um, in terms of the substance, because it is uh, very onerous to get a project approved through the, the federal grants process right now, but it doesn't have to be. We could move money more quickly and then have a structure set up where instead of um, you know, getting plans approved, having that work through the process for three to four to five years, and then actually getting to construct, you could actually commit to report on the work that you do within a set of um, objectives. You could do the work, you could show the accountability for that work and you could get reimbursed, right? I mean, there are ways to do this. It's not actually rocket science, but it does um, require thinking differently about how we administer grants and how we track funding and how we hold cities accountable for the work that they do. I think a block grant program differently set up could um, make a lot of, of changes, uh, transformational changes within a short amount of time. Yeah, and, and I'll just jump in at the last point that you made about the block grant program. I, I think if, if we can cobble together our collective energies as cities to really push that, that's a transformational thing that can come out of the next administration, having direct access and funding through an existing uh, block grant program um, and have it dedicated to those mobility needs that are focused on, you know, transit, uh, pedestrian infrastructure and alike. I, th that will fundamentally change uh, how we can more quickly deliver those projects. So, uh, so I definitely, definitely agree on that. And, and I do think that, that um, as reflected from the transition team, and if you look at the membership, these are, these are the right people on, on that team. Right, and so from leader Phil Washington to Polly being on the on the team, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us have worked with them already, and there's a strong a city focus on on that, and real practitioners that kind of understand what the needs are. So even starting from a structural standpoint, they're talking the right things that we need to to hear um, uh, from a city standpoint. Hopefully, they'll, they'll get embedded in kind of the next uh, set of um, infrastructure. Um, programs that will come from the administration. So I, I do think the language is catching up with where cities are and hopefully uh, the, the funding will be able to be allocated in a manner where we can deliver a lot of our work in a quicker fashion and have more control over what we're trying to, to do because a lot of the issues are localized issues. Um, I think all of us, you know, our, our Vision Zero programs, which in Denver we have our Vision Zero efforts, that's primarily a localized issue and it's an equity issue uh, where we have you know, quite frankly, 5% of our roadways uh, contribute to over 50% of our fatalities. We had, last year we had 70 fatalities in Denver. This year we're tracking uh, a little bit above 50, even with the, the decrease in the amount of people traveling around. Um, and the majority of people are still getting killed. There's still pedestrians and, and folks uh, involved in 
auto pay crashes. But um, out of the 5%, about, I would say 90 to 95% of that 5% of the roads are in what we call areas that are high equity areas in, in the city. And so um, when we talk about safety, we're, you know, at the same time, it is an equity issue. And so having that type of language to be able to bubble up through the um, transition team and get to the administration, I think is all going to benefit us in the long run. Yeah, I mean, just sort of underscored that, that point about <laughs> here in Chicago, I'm sure it's the same for, for others. Uh, you know, if we want to do something quickly, we, we really can't use federal funds because <laughs> it just, it, you know, the, the process is, is so long. So, and it seems like a, a lot of the federal processes are set up for kind of mega projects and it makes smaller scale treatments um, really, yeah, it's just not, the, the effort required is, is, not, is not worth it. Um, and if there's a, a local fiscal environment or a state fiscal environment where the where federal funds, you know, in a certain year or a certain group of years represent a lot of the money that you have available because there isn't enough local money available, then that can really hamstring making like smaller scale changes. And so I think there are ways and I, I, I do totally get the impression that the current administration, the, the people that have been talked about there are advising them should be able to get these issues. And so, you know, that's very promising that I, I didn't get the sense that there was any sort of interest in, in solving these sort of problems with the, the outgoing administration. Um, one other point I just want to bring up, and maybe this might you know, touch on another topic you want to bring up, but is, is just the, the capacity, the, the bandwidth, as, as we say these days, to, to, to do kind of what needs to be done. And, you know, because of the, you know, local, uh, fiscal constraints, at least here in Chicago and in Illinois, um, there's just, there's, there's, you know, frankly, it's, it's a struggle to have the, the staff resources to sort of take on everything that needs to be done. And it's sort of exacerbated if there's a lot of administrative process that we need to go through, you just need the, the people who can, can do all of this. And, and yet the, the, the federal funding sort of isn't available to, to, to pay for those staff positions, that's that's a local problem, and so there, there maybe there may be creative ways to you know for the feds to to help out with that too. I think wrapping around to to what I heard a few of you say, um, the vocabulary, the approach in our minds, it's are they using the metrics that we want to build our projects to actually achieve, and um, maybe a little less so under the current administration, but previously metrics of safety. Met metrics of accessibility to key services, much less than metrics of moving vehicles or uh, you know speeds. When we start to hear this language in the grant applications or in, the, or in their approaches that a project that does this list of things over this list of things, that really gives us hope that it is worth all that effort to get something up and going because at the end of the day, we're going to get the end results that we've been looking for locally. Great. Uh, if I can just ask one more, and then we have a lot of questions that are coming in. Uh, I, I didn't prep this, but I'm just hoping that you'll, you'll roll with me. Uh, a lot of you talked about, you know, the safety challenges on the street in Vision Zero. I'm curious what you would hope or expect the administration uh, would do with car companies, especially as vehicles are getting bigger. Um, and as many of you saw, there's a, now an, e, an electric Hummer, um, which, you know, may be good for the environment, but it isn't so great for street safety. So I'm curious if you have perspectives of, you know, sort of the relationship between the car manufacturers and the administration and certain things that you'd want to ask for in terms of regulation or you'd, you'd want the Biden administration to, to focus on. Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry, I think this, this came up earlier. Sorry, I forgot who, who mentioned it, but, you know, speed limits, you know, is, is key and they tend to be governed at the state level or have need to have a lot of state input into changing speed limits. And I think the cities are more maybe well attuned to understanding, you know, so no matter the size of the, the, the vehicle, slower is, is, is better. Um, but then, yeah, maybe there's a role for NISTA too to take more seriously looking at vehicle design, looking at front end design, and you know, and, and what are, you know, what are the physical um, relationships and are there ways to, to make, you know, vehicles safer, um, giving consumer preferences, that's really tough. Yeah, I, th I think to, to build on that, typically the, the safety metrics that we see car companies using are all about the safety metrics for the people inside the car, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and some of those, I, I think this 
uh, group probably is well aware about of this, but in, in case they're not, you know, as you increase perhaps the, um, the stability of, of the car in a rollover crash, well, you're also increasing the blind spots that that driver then has to deal with as uh, he or she, you know, maneuvers through the city. And so if we could redefine or actually ask the question about what does safety mean for people outside of the vehicle, not just inside the vehicle, I mean, that would be, that's not even on the table at present, as I understand it from the um, car manufacturer perspective, putting that out there as a serious concern and a public health concern um, would be an important first step. Yeah, and beyond passenger cars, uh, freight vehicles are you disproportionately contribute Absolutely. to harming uh, other road users. And so, side guards on trucks are, you know, better mirror systems, lower panel windows and truck doors, and things like that. These are all things that are being done in other parts of the world, um, and probably not because the vehicle manufacturers thought of it themselves. I think there was some pressure from the governments as a public as a public health measure. The other place I think that can really um, add value is the requirements for data. Uh, these companies work and they collect a ton of different data. And now with the internet of things, they're collecting more and more, not just about crashes, but about uh, times brakes are hit or swerves or slowdowns or avoidances. And that stuff that if we know now, we can actually change our Vision Zero map from where people are getting hit that we have to fix to where people aren't even crossing because they don't feel safe going there. It's a very different conversation that if they know that is part of the equation about putting a new vehicle on the road, you're going to provide that level of detail to us. That just changes how we plan. Yeah, and to echo that, I think there's a, um, hopefully a better understanding that uh, vehicle design also needs to come with enhanced technology um, that can actually communicate with vehicle to vehicle, um, as well as kind of whatever future technology that would make uh, the interaction between vehicles, pedestrians and bicyclists much more safe. And so I know here in, in Denver, we were, um, we had the opportunity to actually get a, uh, an award uh, and a grant um, uh, awarded to us from Federal Highway maybe about three years ago um, with the AECT MTD. And don't tell me what that acronym stands for. Uh, but, but that was a federal grant that allowed us to actually test out new technologies to um, really enhance how our infrastructure, whether it be our, our traffic uh, signals and the like, can, can talk to large trucks, so having connected freight, um, also providing an opportunity to have our signals uh, uh, communicate with other vehicles, regardless of what operating system that's being manufactured, whether it be uh, the DSRC kind of connections and the like, or, or what is called CV to X, which is cellular connections within the infrastructure. And we've been able to utilize a grant to test out a whole bunch of technologies. And, and what we're finding is that Yes, there is a way to, de to detect uh, pedestrians from a vehicular standpoint. Uh, there is a way that we can communicate more effectively uh, for vehicles um, to give them um, more warnings around trouble spot areas, uh, you know, at intersections and the like. And so I, I think there's opportunity to really dovetail more in the technology side of the game, um, hopefully with the new administration to really bring some of these unique technologies to bear and deploy them in a much more effective manner. So cities can build the next generation of infrastructure that can communicate with all of the new vehicles, regardless of the, you know, their, their powertrain mechanism, whether or not it's, it's, it's gas powered or electric or the size of it, it's, a, it's an opportunity to share information and share data to be able to manage and operate the system in a safer way. Thank you all. Um, so we, we have a number of questions. I'd ask if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Uh, but I just want to start. There was a, a question um, that was about the uncertainty of life after the pandemic and specifically asking with sort of cars being more PPE and a decline in public transit of how you're thinking about the uncertainty of COVID as it relates to immediate transportation plans in your cities. I can start. Um, 
I mean, this is a, a little bit outside of what the city's Department of Transportation does here in, in Chicago, but it's still very closely related to the our city and our economic vitality as the just tr what's going to happen to transit. Uh, I mean, the trend, this was, there was an article in the New York Times a couple of days ago about this, but I, I don't think, it doesn't seem to me that our country is taking seriously enough the, the, the crisis that's looming for public transit. They just, they don't have enough money and they're about to hit a cliff. And once that service goes, I know our country does not have a very strong history of reinstating service, transit service once it's been taken away. And it's, we're about to lose like half or three quarters of the transit service we have. And for cities like Chicago, New York, Boston, Washington, that are extremely dependent upon transit for our economic environment. We were just built around transit. It's, I don't know, it's something that other cities aspire to, but it's like, in this case, that, that sort of asset theoretically could turn into a huge liability. Will our downtown ever come back? I mean, there's like nearly a million people working downtown Chicago <laughs> and, and they cannot all get there by car. You know, we would have to like sort of shift to becoming more like Houston or something like that. When, when really Houston should be shifting to become more like Chicago, right? And from a, you know, from a uh, environmental perspective and for other a lot of you know social benefit perspective. But but like if we if the feds can't step in and 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 help transit, we're 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 in a world of hurt. <laughs> I, I I think Jeff. Put that well, right? It it is about the the lifeline to transit and and rail operators right now that they need. I think that the the fundamentals of cities, I I think in some ways are only being underscored by the pandemic. Um, you know, and and I'm not I'm not in New York clearly. I'm in, in San Jose, and it's been a while since I lived in New York, but. Um, but I think that the, how disconnected we've been from each other, like we all uh, miss that and we seek to get back into where we can share space with each other in much more you know, uh, connected ways. And so I think there's a real um, you know, light at, at the end of the tunnel. And I think you know, we all have enough Zoom fatigue to realize that uh, this is not the way we want to, to live. Um, how, what that means for public transit in the immediate term, I think Jeff hit it on the head. That's the question that, that we need to, to answer. Um, so I, I wanna focus, uh, shift here for a second. Um, Kelsey asked about um, what advocates and scholars can do to help accelerate organizational change within local DOTs. So uh, you, I guess I, I, if anybody wants to take this one, you. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I may step in on that, but but just uh, just to, to button up the last question though, I I, I do think that uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how uh, the nation and our cities recover from the pandemic. Um, uh, I I do believe that there there will probably be changes in how people, um, you know, commute, uh, whether or not to commute at all to work. Um, I, I'm more, I think that's gonna be their driving factor as opposed to transit being safe. Um, and so we still have people taking transit and, and here in Denver, we, we have about, um, I would say 52% of the ridership that's still been retained here in Denver, but we still have routes that are operating at 100% or 99% um, pre-COVID. So we start talking about, again, this equity thing um, those populations that are dependent on transit still need the service, right? Because if they could go to another mode, they would. So I think just, just keep that in mind that, that, that collectively, if we can continue to push to make sure we have, there's funding to help support transit, you are solving, um, you know, an equity uh, and mobility issue. But on, on, you know, we recently, you know, we went through a huge, uh, it, there in Denver, a huge organizational change uh, to change the culture. Uh, within how we think about you know transportation mobility and the like, and I think I I, I think um, we we actually and I, I think one of the partners for this um, session was the Denver Street Partnership, and you know um, they they pushed I think the city to change his mindset of how we think about our streets, and so there's value from hearing the advocacy voice because um, sometimes you need that that type of um, encouragement. I'll use that word <laughs> encouragement to change to change how you, you want to deliver things and 
and they're supposed to be the voice of of the people that that need the mobility options. And so it's us as uh, kind of leaders in the public sector space to really figure out, well, what, well, is the organization set up to be able to really plan for design and deliver these projects that you're hearing from the advocacy community? So I, I think, you know, we appreciate their sponsor, their partnership. They supported us and all of our, um, you know, changes as a department. And then lo and behold, now we have a better way that we can showcase Yes, we can change how we think about how we design our streets and the world's not gonna end and it's gonna solve you know, a need that has been identified for from the advocacy community. So, so I, I'll just stop there, but, I, but I, that's been my experience and I think it's been a fruitful one. As long as it's positive and as long as you, know, you have the two kind of entities working together, you can, you can make an impact. I think both of those questions come together uh, for us. Um, for a very long time here in Houston, and I think around the country, there was a belief that traffic was a fait accompli. There was no doubt you were gonna wake up and at 8.30 in the morning, there was gonna be traffic on your road. And that's not true. This pandemic for all its horrific, everything that's happened, and I'm not underestimating uh, what's about to happen in transit, has shown us that we have way more control over our transportation systems than a lot of us remembered for a long time. Uh, now, certainly creating a global pandemic to get to that point may not have been the best means to the end, but uh, allowing the advocacy community to point that out to us, to say, look, we don't have to have gridlock at 8.30 in the morning. We have other options. If we take control of the demand management, if we can take control of multimodal supply side, and recognize that we can break ourselves out of a mindset to plan our cities differently. So as soon as anybody says, you'll never get rid of the traffic in Texas, I point them out my window these days. Well, it um, brings, brings up that uh, truism uh, that traffic is an economic issue, not an infrastructure one. And I think the the, the transportation field, um, you know, has has forgotten and remembered that at different points, right? And that is absolutely a, a reminder. Um, interesting to be, you know, on this this call today uh, with Denver, with with Houston in particular. Not to leave out Chicago or New York, but um, we are undergoing uh, an access and mobility plan to try to figure out. You know, we have these bold goals, right? To go from nearly 80% drive alone to roughly 40% drive alone as a city within uh, the lifetime of our general plan, 2040. Um, this access and mobility plan is really about how are we going to get there and how do we set up our, our department and our city to do so? And so, you know, it's um, the, the organizational part of that work is really interesting and really hard, right? Because we have to set ourselves up to be, um, you know, even more effective, even more strategic to realize the goals that we've set forth. So it is a, a process of, um, you know, being willing to, to ask what we can do better, how we can do it better. That's not always easy, right? Especially, um, especially while we're all spread apart and looking at each other in tiny, tiny rectangles, um, because it takes a lot of trust and it takes a lot of work, both internal and with external partners, like Lois was saying, you know, advocates, other agencies that we work with, right? We've all got to got to work on it together and ask the hard questions. So, um, yeah, I think uh, organizational change is a constant, but you do have these moments where you have to step back and and ask the questions and then figure out how we move forward together. So we're, we're at the beginning of one of those processes as well in San Jose. Just if I add a few words on, on advocates, I think uh, obviously, you know, we have a lot of interaction with advocacy community here in Chicago too. And uh, I think what maybe from a high level, I think advocates are, are great in terms of keeping us focused on sort of what's the, the latest thinking in terms of what, what do we mean by effectiveness when we make decisions in the transportation realm how or why is it effective? And I think maybe earlier in my career, it seemed like a lot of that was focused on physical design. It's how, what, what makes a street a not just safe, but also comfortable environment for all the different 
users, the people who want to be on that street, whether they're in or outside of vehicles or what kind of vehicle they're using. And, and that's that sort of design and physical focus is great too. But I think, you know, recently, in, you know, and, and especially in the last year, it's, there's been a lot more shift onto the social factors side of advocacy too, and, and understanding, okay, so you could have a street that's designed just perfectly from a, from a, you know, this should be a very comfortable street to walk on and the traffic is tamed and, you know, and the sidewalk is wide enough and, and it's all ADA compliant. Um, but if people don't feel comfortable on that street because they're afraid of what's happening in the neighborhood or they're afraid of the, you know, the way police behave or they're, you know, whatever fears they may have, that affects how they use the public environment, no matter how well we physically designed it. So it sort of like blows up our traditional DOT type of thinking into, my goodness, this is, this is, you know, this is, a, this is a holistic <laughs> issue with, with uh, us and public health and planning and law enforcement and everything. And, and uh, I, I don't know that we have any answers. I don't know. I don't necessarily, but, but, but better understanding the problem is the first step in, in figuring out what, what the solutions are. So, so that's, that's been very helpful. And I think that's been advocate led for the most part so far. Okay. Thank you all. Um, so just as we're, as we're nearing the hour, um, there are a lot of other questions that have come in. So I, I just want to ap um, apologize to anybody who shared them, if we weren't able to get to them. Um, to our panelists, there are a few questions in the Q and A. Some are directed to you, so if you have a minute, you can, if you have a sentence or two, to add to it. Um, but I just wanted to sort of close with a. Um, I hate the question of if there was only one thing you could do, but I'm going to ask that question. But if there was sort of one thing that you wanted the administration to prioritize uh, in its first hundred days that you think could be transformational for your work and also realistic, given the movement, given how how things move in Washington. Is there something if, you know, we know that um, President-elect Biden and, and, and Kamala Harris are, are sitting on this call as well, and if, if they were here, what, would you, what advice would you give them for the first 100 days? Well, I'll jump in and claim the one that I already <laughs> alluded to earlier, that I really think that addressing the pending transit funding crisis is, is, just, is just critical. What if, if, if we allow transit agencies to start our slash service even more than some already have, it, it's it's gonna be really bad to, to try to get that back. Um, and, and not just have the Fed step in to help transit operations immediately during the crisis, but really if we're going to tackle the climate and the equity challenges that we have facing us, I think the Feds are gonna to need to just you know, commit themselves, um, you know, this primarily means probably more Congress than administration, but we need all the help we can get, you know, so. That's just it's my two cents, personal opinions here, not, not necessarily the position of my employer. Yeah, I think um, if, if I had one thing, it would be to that the, the federal government would put forward a challenge to states and cities to work with them on um, basically, you know, tripling our resource investment in equitable climate strategies, right? So kind of putting the, the money where our mouth is, recognizing that it will take, you know, a partnership of all three to um, get anywhere meaningful in a short amount of time. Uh, that, that's what I'd like to see. So I would go with, uh, and I agree with both of those, but now I get to add a third. Um, don't get focused on silver bullet projects. There are, I would rather fund my complete 1500 miles of high bump, high comfort bike facilities for a fraction of the cost of any silver bullet project. And we'd put more people to work. We'd uh, provide access to way more of our community. We would deal with both equity and environment as opposed to one super mega project that's gonna just take forever to get done. Yeah, and, I, and I'll throw throw my uh, two cents in here. Um, one, I think we mentioned the, the kind of the blog program uh, effort that, that that's something that can be done immediately. That's that's um, that's on the on the front of of a lot of folks' minds here. But but also, you know, the coming out of essentially this pandemic, this recession generated um, economy that we're dealing with due to the pandemic is an opportunity to utilize the infrastructure to get people back to work. And so I think they, that's a, 
a fantastic opportunity to figure out how to have a long-term sustainable infrastructure program that also has a component of workforce development in it that cities can take advantage of. Um, if, if that's the tone and the nature of, of building out um, you know, the, 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 the new um, federal funding program, I think um, every city and every locality would jump on it and would, would support it. And so, um, and it would be catalytic and it would get the, the country back to work again. Well, as they, as we say, from uh, fr from your work, from your lips to uh, the, the president elect's ears. So, um, thank you all for this incredible conversation, um, and, and also just a personal thank you. I know all of you are, you know, fighting on the front lines in your cities for the kind of people first vision that you know I think we've all really longed for, um, and now we really have a, a, a moment to to truly reimagine the future of our cities and. In New York, you know, as in other cities, we, we truly believe that our streets must be a pathway to recovery. And I think all of you, you know, ha have said the same. Um, so I'm really excited to continue to, to track your progress. Uh, and there's so much that we can all learn from each other. So a huge thank you, David, Euless, Jeff, and Jessica. Thank you very much. Keep up the great work. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank, thank you. Thank you.